Superconductivity was discovered in Leiden in 1911 by Gavin Lonnes and is still a hot research topic today. We will bring you from the first observations, to the difficulties in forming a working theory, to the new challenges of high temperature superconductivity. Superconductivity is a state of matter, perhaps somewhat similar to uh, water and steam or ice being a state of, uh, well, water molecules. But now superconductivity is a state of electronic matter. And this state is quite magical, perhaps because superconductivity is based so deeply on, uh, on quantum mechanics. And it has these amazing properties. I guess uh, the most famous property is that it has zero resistivity. So if you have a ring, for example, you let a current through that ring, this current will just go on forever. So this is quite you know, unique in nature. It's quite rare that in nature you have zeros. So the resistivity is not just small, it really is zero. So we're standing here in front of one of the machines of Kamenonis. It's a helium liquefier. So he liquefied helium for the first time here in Leiden. But while doing so, he also noticed that the resistance of one of his thermometers dropped down to zero. And I had a mercury thermometer, and they didn't know, of course, that mercury becomes superconducting. So they were just measuring a temperature, and at some point, the resistance of this thermometer dropped and therefore they didn't have a signal anymore and so they, they the, the beginning they were thinking that this was a mistake uh, but instead they were actually discovering the phenomenon of superconductivity. Now, what happens in a superconductor is that electrons, which usually uh, repel each other because they're both negatively charged, form pairs, kind of weird kind of pairs that overlap and are really big. And these pairs then condense. For what you used to have, you know, these billions of electrons moving in complicated ways, you only have one wave function, one parameter to describe them because they all are, in some ways, they all behave like one object a quantum mechanical condensate. And that is what makes this state so special. So it is really a, an example of emergence. It's something where you had many complicated particles now behaving as one wave function. After superconductivity was discovered in Leiden, it took a long time until people understood superconductivity. And it was not for lack of trying. In fact, all the great physicists of that time worked at least for a while on understanding superconductivity. But still, it took, I think, more than 40 years. And in large part, I think that was due to the fact that there was no good language to describe the many-body quantum mechanical state. There's still no good language. It's a very, very hard problem. But at least in some special cases, we know how to describe it. Superconductivity emerges from one of these states that we actually know how to describe quite well. In the, in the 80s, things changed quite uh, dramatically with the discovery of high temperature superconductors. These are superconductors, but they superconduct at temperatures that are way higher than conventional superconductors. Despite early expectations that this will change technology overnight. It actually took a while and we're perhaps not where we want to be from a, from an applications point of view, perhaps because we still don't understand these materials. They seem to be quite different beasts than uh, conventional superconductors. One thing that I think is similar to uh, the history of conventional superconductivity is that we seem to not really understand the normal state from which superconductivity emerges. In some ways, it's like dark matter. It's one of the big mysteries of physics. So many groups are, are working on the problem of high temperature superconductivity. Uh, there are many people who do theory, many people who do experiments. And of course, we, we work together a lot 
to try to find a, an explanation for this phenomena. Uh, my group, for example, we do experiments. We work with STM. We have a very sharp tip that we scan over the sample with atomic resolution. So it's like a microscope, but with a resolution that is, you know, less than one atom. Welcome in the Kamerling Omnes lab. Uh, the lab is still named after the discovery of the liquid helium and the superconductivity. And here's our microscope. So this machine looks very complicated and complex, but actually the very heart of the microscope, or the microscope itself, is very small. It's down inside there, in the big door. And just to show you guys, this is how it looks. This is a very sharp needle, or tip, that we use to scan the materials. So this tip goes inside here in the, in the microscope. And then if we insert a sample above, we can use this tip to scan over the surface of the, of the superconductor. And then we try to find uh, the microscopic mechanisms of these strange materials with this microscope. The problem is that all these materials are so these very weird oxides and are all very complicated and they all look very tailored to, to like people engineered them, right, to, to get these properties. And so they're intrinsically dirty and they're intrinsically messy. So we try to, we try to look at these materials on the atomic scale. We do that because we think that in, in these materials, in high temperature superconductors, things are quite, you know, inhomogeneous on, on a nanometer scale. So we believe that we really need to look at them on these very small spatial uh, length scales to understand them. Of course, there are other experiments that do it on, on much larger time, uh, length scales, and we need to work together to get all the aspects. The hope is that if we look at the problem from many different sides and also work together with theorists, we might get closer to an explanation of this mystery.